He was an 18th century Swedish scientist who made breakthroughs in physics, anatomy, and brain research. He was a religious visionary whose works have inspired writers such as Balzac, Blake, Emerson, and Strindberg. His life was a relentless quest to discover the divine master plan. He was Emanuel Swedenborg, the man who had to know. The Lord opened my eyes. I have seen things which lie deeply concealed in man. During his last years, Swedenborg lived in simple rented rooms in London, attended by his maid, Elizabeth Reynolds. A frequent caller here was Reverend Arvid Ferelius, a pastor of the Swedish Lutheran Church. I held my hands together and prayed, and then I answered, Lord knoweth better than I will do so, said he. I found my name to signify Elizabeth. Love me in reality, or... Good day, Elizabeth. Fell again into a state. Your reverence. What can it be? Baron Swedenborg is attending guests. Jesus Christ. No, your reverence. Baron Swedenborg is quite alone. Hmm? He's been at it, speaking this way and that for three days and nights now. Hasn't eaten, hasn't slept. Hasn't come out of his chamber at all. Purified me. Well, could you please tell him that whereas I hadn't seen him in church in several weeks, I had wished to inquire as to... Good Ferelius, please join me. Good sir, I do not wish to intrude. Now, please join me. Please be seated, my friend. Thank you. How have you fared these last weeks? I have been tormented for the past ten days and nights by wicked spirits. Wicked spirits? Yes. Now, I'm in the presence of good spirits, and they have revealed to me many wondrous things. Perhaps you would find peace if you were to attend our church services more regularly. Perhaps. But I find no peace in church on account of the spirits who contradict much of what the minister says. My friend, I have come to offer you comfort and relief from these fantasies which vex your soul. Sir, I am well aware that many will say that no one can talk to spirits and angels as long as he still lives in the body, and that it is a fantasy. By all this, I am not deterred, for I have seen, I have heard, and I have felt. Swedenborg analyzed these experiences with a scientific attitude befitting an 18th century gentleman of the age of reason. The aristocracy of 18th century Europe. Some lived in a world of Rococo frivolities. For others, it was the age of reason the Enlightenment. It was an era that turned from religious dogma to rational thought and science. Swedenborg, born in Stockholm in 1688, grew up in this world. An honor student at Uppsala University, he was skilled in nine languages. As heir to his father's title, Baron Swedenborg was an active member of the Swedish House of Lords. A versatile inventor, his designs include a glider aircraft, the first known vehicle to incorporate aerodynamic principles necessary for flight. Appointed Royal Assessor of Mines in 1719, Swedenborg helped establish the sciences of metallurgy and crystallography. Swedenborg mastered all the sciences. He published over 70 treatises in Latin on subjects from astronomy to zoology. He anticipated many later findings, such as the molecular basis of magnetism and the nebular origin of planetary systems. But Swedenborg never considered science an end in itself. I was introduced to the natural sciences, and I studied them for 30 years. 
Thus I was prepared to understand the things which lie deeply concealed in man and serve as an instrument for laying them bare. Swedenborg began this quest with an exhaustive study of human anatomy and physiology. His many findings include the discovery of the function of the endocrine glands. But by the 1740s, he focused all of his research on a single subject, the human brain. He was first to discover the synchronous action of the brain and lungs, the functions of the cerebellum and pituitary, the thinking and memory areas of the cerebral cortex, and the integrative action of the nervous system. By all your many sciences and studies, you have been of great service to the learned doctors and physicians. So why should you concern yourself with spirits and such things? These are matters best left to the church. The single purpose of my studying anatomy was to search for the seat of the soul in the body. For the soul is represented in the body, which is its mirror. But he would not find the soul by dissecting the brain. The purely intellectual approach, the methodology of the age of reason, would not suffice. Swedenborg had to go beyond the intellect to experience the soul directly. Swedenborg continued his search for the soul by exploring the mysteries of his own mind. For years, he analyzed his dreams and visions, compiling one of the most complete records of inner experiences ever assembled. Swedenborg also developed a meditation technique for probing his own subconscious. Although he was probably unfamiliar with Eastern meditation, his techniques were similar to those of yogis and other Asian mystics. The monks and saints of Asia, they all turned within, striving to go beyond the individual personality to the universal core, the soul. And Swedenborg, like the great visionary saints, was to experience a transformation. It occurred one April evening in 1745. Twice, a vision of Jesus appeared to Swedenborg and instructed him to change the course of his life. Make me worthy of thy grace. And you believe he was actually before you, in your very room, Yes, and from that day forth I gave up the study of worldly sciences and I labored in spiritual things. The Lord opened my eyes so that I could see in the middle of the day the other world and in a state of perfect wakefulness converse with angels and spirits. Swedenborg treated these angels and spirits as reflections of his own subconscious. For example, he believed that an angel in a vision or dream corresponds to that which is angelic within ourselves. A demon corresponds to that which is demonic. And he developed a system to interpret this kind of imagery, which he called correspondences. The Bible. Swedenborg discovered in many passages symbolic imagery similar to that of his dreams and visions. And he recognized that these symbols were correspondences, divinely inspired guides to human psychology and the soul. For example, the opening passages of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth can be translated in the beginning, we are each created with spiritual realities, symbolized by heaven, and material needs, symbolized by earth. As we evolve, we 
we'll learn to strike a balance within ourselves, integrating heavenly and earthly concerns. This evolution culminates symbolically on the sixth day with the creation of Adam, who represents wisdom, and Eve, who represents love. The union of wisdom and love leads to the psychological wholeness, the inner peace, represented by the seventh day, the day of rest. Each of the other images in the story of creation, creeping things, fish, beasts, represents a stage in the evolution of human consciousness. Genesis, when viewed in the light of correspondences, becomes an ageless model of man created in the image and likeness of God. For man is the microcosm, the universe in miniature. All things which exist in the created universe have such a correspondence with all things of man that it may be said that man is a kind of universe. Swedenborg had at last found the gateway to the soul in the hidden meanings of the Bible. He published many volumes of his interpretations anonymously, signing them simply, A Servant of the Lord. But his visionary activities were becoming famous because of certain psychic talents he had acquired during his long journey within. Many reports survive of Swedenborg's predicting future events, having clairvoyant visions, and relating information known only to dead persons. Mrs. William Castell witnessed the best documented of Swedenborg's clairvoyant visions. It occurred at a dinner party attended by Swedenborg and 15 other guests at her home in Gothenburg, Sweden, in 1759. I noticed he pushed his plate aside and became much more agitated. And I inquired again if there was anything I could do. Well, he stood up and soon began talking and telling us about a fire in Stockholm. Stockholm? But Stockholm is some 300 miles distant from your home in Gothenburg. Yes, but he described in every detail how the fire began, the buildings it was consuming, how it was finally extinguished just two doors from his house. This was on Thursday, Saturday, a messenger came from Stockholm and we learned that every detail Swedenborg had told us was true. Well, people of all sorts then became curious. But even in Germany, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant sent a personal representative to interview me. Indeed. And it is told that Swedenborg has visited heaven and hell. But of course, that is a matter. Really, madam, this is a subject I care not to discuss. I am a good Christian. All of my family are good Christians. And we accept with perfect faith that which the church teaches us regarding the matters of the afterlife. I'm sure you understand. Oh, of course. I quite understand. Orthodox 18th century notions of the afterlife were rather simplistic. On the day of judgment, the graves open, and each person is resurrected with a physical body to face a celestial bureaucracy. Swedenborg refuted these notions in several books. This greatly upset traditionalists, such as his friend, Reverend Ferelius. You are a learned man, sir, versed in scriptures. Surely you can understand, despite whatever things your spirits tell you. It is like our course of law. On the day of judgment, the pious are rewarded. The wicked are punished. Now, each of us is his own judge. For heaven and hell are also within us. We are each living eternity now. 
Swedenborg wrote that we experience heaven and hell on earth and that the worlds beyond the grave are extensions of the psychological realities of daily life. Death is not an extinction, but a continuation of life, merely a transition from one state to another. In several visions, Swedenborg experienced the process of dying and saw others enter the afterlife. He said that immediately following death, there's a period of self-discovery. The social masks worn on earth dissolve away and the true self is revealed. Each person then shapes his own eternity to correspond with his real inner nature. Some become irrational, driven by fear and greed. They are in a state Swedenborg called hell. Hell is a psychological condition which corresponds to the suffering we experience on Earth when we allow ourselves to be driven by the blind greed of our own egos. There are no devils here to inflict punishments, since in the state of hell, each person acts out his own malice by tormenting others. Really, sir? No devil? But, Your Lordship, you mean to say there aren't no devil? No devils. No demons. Such is the equilibrium of everything in the other life that one brings punishment and torment unto himself. After death, others find within themselves a psychological state Swedenborg called heaven. It is a joyous condition, a state of expanded awareness, of perceiving more and more of the grand plan of creation. The heaven which Swedenborg experienced corresponds to deeds, not creeds. So persons of many races and religions form the societies of heaven, which Swedenborg often called the Church of the Lord. My friend, how can your so-called Church of the Lord include heathens and idolaters? Surely the Lord will cast them into the pit of hell. The Church of the Lord consists of all those who have lived in the good of charity according to their own belief. The Church of the Lord is universal. Good day, my friend. As Swedenborg approached the end of his life, his writings continued to be unacceptable to the officialdom of the Church of Sweden. This posed a problem for Reverend Ferelius, who in the winter of 1772 was coming to visit Swedenborg for the last time. You have been ill, my friend. Have you considered that perhaps you might soon die? <laughs> yes. Soon it will be my time to die. Are you willing to receive the Lord's Supper? With thankfulness. Have you read my views on the true meaning of communion? No, I'm sorry. I cannot say that I have. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner? Certainly, as long as I have to carry around this sinful body. My friend, quite a number of people think that your sole purpose in promulgating this new theological system has been to make a name for yourself. If such be the case, you ought now to do the world and yourself a justice to retract it, either in whole or in part, especially if you cannot expect to derive any additional advantage in this world, which you will soon be leaving. When you enter eternity, you will see everything. 
then you and I shall have much to talk about. Before their parting, Swedenborg presented Reverend Ferelius with one of the last copies of his book, Heavenly Secrets. But Swedenborg was to leave another minister a somewhat more unusual token of his abilities. Reading this, I felt my heart strangely warmed. The England in which Swedenborg spent his last months witnessed the growth of several new Protestant sects. One of these was Methodism. Its founder was John Wesley. That he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Every man and... A letter for you, sir. This is highly peculiar. It was only days ago. A most curious letter was delivered to me. I remember it exactly. It said, Sir, I have been informed in the world of spirits that you have a strong desire to converse with me. I shall be happy to see you. If you will favor me with a visit, I am, sir, your humble servant, Emanuel Swedenborg. I felt exceedingly astonished, for I had been strongly impressed with a desire to see and converse with this gentleman. I sent a reply at once, stating I am at present closely occupied in preparing for a six-month journey, but will do the pleasure of waiting upon Mr. Swedenborg soon after my return to London. And now, this. Sir, I am sorry to reply that your proposed visit will be too late, as next month, on March 29th, 1772, I shall enter the world of spirits, never more to return. Your humble servant, Emanuel Swedenborg. What time is it? It's five o'clock, your lordship. That is good. I thank you. God bless you. ago he told me your reverence he said he said he was to die on the 29th of March at five o'clock and he was as pleased as if he was going to have a holiday and go to some merrymaking death is not an extinction but a continuation of life Merely a transition from one state to another. When you enter eternity, you will see everything. And then you and I shall have much to talk about. Reverend Ferelius conducted Swedenborg's funeral in London on April 5th, 1772 his last official act before returning to Sweden. In 1908, Swedenborg's remains were transferred to a place of honor in Sweden's Uppsala Cathedral. His insights remain in the teachings of the Church of the New Jerusalem and have inspired many remarkable people. John Chapman, an American folk hero who dedicated his life to living in harmony with nature. He is better known as Johnny Appleseed because he planted apple orchards across the American frontier. But he also planted spiritual seeds, handing out pages from Swedenborg's books, which he called good news right fresh from heaven. 
Johnny Appleseed, the first American missionary of Swedenborg's teachings. Blind, deaf, and mute since childhood, Helen Keller grew up to be an inspiration for people around the world. In her book, My Religion, she writes of Swedenborg. His truths have been to my faculties what light, color, and music are to the eye and ear. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I can see. And there was Greta Askbom, the daughter of one of his neighbors in Sweden. Greta had heard many stories of Swedenborg's communications with angels. She frequently implored him to show her an angel. At last, one day, he consented. Swedenborg's lesson to her was the simplest and perhaps most eloquent statement of his faith in the spiritual universes within each of us. Greta, this is the day you've been looking forward to so long. Sit down. One hand over this eye, and the other hand over this eye. That's it. Now wait. All right, take your hands down now. Now open your eyes. Now, at last, you're going to see an angel. The nonprofit Swedenborg Foundation, with offices in New York City, is dedicated to publishing works by and about Emanuel Swedenborg. For further information and a catalog of available titles, please write to the Swedenborg Foundation.